Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a it's an interesting question. So I thought it would, um, was also good for me to kind of put my thoughts together, and, uh, go a little bit further in my knowledge and of the history of cytophobia and how he's been used. So uh, we're going to be talking about medical staff and um, a lot of off-label use. Uh, so just warning you, and these are my disclosures, um, mostly for research and consulting. Uh, so we're going to talk um, about different things. So a brief history of cytophobia. Um, sorry. How do we how do we give it, which is very important to minimize toxicity, and then we'll talk about the use in stomegalovirus or herpes viruses, coronavirus diseases. Um, well, see if it's good for BK polyoma. I have my opinion on that, and then we'll talk about other viruses uh, or viral related illnesses for which cytophobia is used uh, uh, with success. So the, um, the history of uh, cytophobia begins in uh, 1986 when Antonin Holy, who uh, was a Czech, um, he died in 2012, uh, a Czech chemist and Eric Re Leclerc started working together. Leclerc was a microbiologist, virologist who was working on animal models of vaccinia and smallpox and herpes viruses. And Anthony Holly uh, had this, um, developed these um, uh, phosphonyl methoxyprolyl uh, compounds. And then this was the first one that they found. They published that in Nature in 1986. And then the following year, they studied different compounds that had the same kind of tail of phosphonyl methoxyalkyl derivatives. And uh, the one that you see there, HPMPC, or the cysteine, the cytosine um, analog was the one that was the most potent and the one they, they thought would be the most useful. Um, and that's uh, cytophobia. Um, it is a nucleotide analog of, and it inhibits the viral DNA polymerase, okay? Uh, as, as opposed to Gansicler and Acyclovir, it doesn't need a viral uh, Tamadin kinase, but it just uses the cerebral enzyme. So that's one difference. And it has a quote unquote broad spectrum of activity against uh, DNA viruses, right? This is in vitro, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's active in vivo. All the herpes viruses, for adenoviruses, for pox viruses, for human papilloma viruses, and polyoma viruses. It was approved in 1996 for the treatment of h 3 to make out of virus retinitis. And that's the only, the only approved indication anywhere in the world. One important thing about uh, cytophobia is that it enters into cells by concentration gradient, mostly. So, so they, that's why we give it as a quick infusion so that we can generate that concentration gradient so that the, the molecule can enter into the cells. It's a little bit of fluid phase endocytosis, but it's a minor component. All right, so it's passive diffusion gradient. It is excreted in the proximal renal tubules by the organic ion transported one, okay? And that's what leads to the renal toxicity. It accumulates in the tubules or concentrates in the tubules and leads to cellular tubular injury and nephrotoxicity, okay? And then the other thing, and that's the reason we use Provenacid because Provenacid blocks that transporter and we use intense IV hydration protocols to reduce this risk. So this is how we give cytophobia with this schedule. We can give it to transplant patients, not transplant patients, and, and the, the risk of nephrotoxicity probably in the 20% or less. All right, so as you can see, we start by giving two grams of provenacid, and then we give the, the normal saline. Um, nowadays, we're using also Ringer's lactate, but normal saline is what was used in the trials and this traditional uh, solution. We give 500 cc an hour for three hours, so it's intense. Then we give cytophobia five milligrams per kilogram over 60 minutes. And we follow that by a liter an hour for two hours. I put 999 because most pumps don't have a thousand. So you just have to use the 999. And then we give another gram of provenacid. And then six hours later, we give another gram. When we do this, this as an outpatient, which we do sometimes, we make sure that the patient has provenacid to take at home six hours after they go home. Okay, otherwise, increase their risk of toxicity. These are the trials that led to the approval of um, cytophobia in the US back in 1996. Uh, they were published in early 1997. 
I, um, and basically there were two trials, this one uh, led by Lalesari, where um, an induction of five milligrams per kilo and per week for two weeks and maintenance uh, show a delay or um, you know, non-progression of CMV retinitis compared with people that just had expected or delayed therapy. And then there was an eight trial uh, group uh, trial comparing two do maintenance doses showing that the five milligram per kilogram every other week was better than the three milligrams per kilogram every other week. So, so basically it's five and five and followed by five what we should be using. All right, and then the use in bone marrow transplantation, there was a case report in 1999 uh, that was the first use. And then uh, in 2001, several reports came out with experience from different people. This experience from the URTC, and you can still see that 20 years later, Per Youngman and Catherine Colornier still kind of have uh, the lead on, on these type of uh, infectious disease papers in Europe. So basically uh, it was a collection of cases treated in Europe for CMV pneumonia, other CMV diseases, preemptive therapy, either secondary or primary. And as you can see, there is a response rate, but it's not great, right? So it's 56% for pneumonia, 25% for other diseases. And then, um, you know, a response for secondary preventive therapy, but a failure in a fair amount of patients, okay? Another case series from England. Uh, again, they used it in four patients. Two responded, two didn't respond, and then one that responded uh, didn't recur, and the other one did, did recur. Uh, just, um, uh, um, just to show you in, in kind of in a diagrammatic, diagrammatic uh, perspective how this, these uh, drugs work, right? So you have Ganciclovir, you need the U, UL97 and the, or the tamidine kinase if you're talking about HSV or VCV. And then you have several kinases that make the triphosphate and then they bind to the polymerase and cause the chain termination. With Cytophobia, you don't need uh, uh, to use, so it's independent of the UL97. So you can use it for ganciclovir resistant infections that are based on UL97. Problem is, is that if you have an alteration in the DNA polymerase binding site, you could have resistance to both canciclovir and cytophobia, okay? And foscarinid just binds directly to the polymerase, so uh, it has a different type of um, mutations or, or mutational profile that leads to resistance. Sometimes you can have viruses or CMB viruses that are resistant to the three of them. Um, what I would say is that the, at least the, the most, even though there is no randomized trials uh, on, with cytophobia itself, I think the most useful uh, use of cytophobia is for adenoviral diseases in uh, transplant, transplant patients, both solid organ and bone marrow. It is off-label uh, and basically, um, you know, it's been shown several times that if you treat earlier, uh, these patients, uh, they tend to survive. There's adenovirus disease, as we can kind of test, can be very quickly, can, can move fast, and, and can be from diagnosis to death, can occur within a week if you're not doing surveillance in high-risk populations. So, um, and I'm going to bring, uh, bring it over, not because it's been developed, but because it has a um, an important story uh, regarding the use of cytophobia for BK virus, right? So cytophobia was developed on, uh, as a lipid conjugate of cytophobia, right? Um, and basically the two things is that the phospholipid allowed it to be um, trans uh, transferring to the intracellular space better like a phospholipid. So therefore it's much more potent than um, than cytophobia, but and because of that lipid tail, it's not an organic uh, ion transporter one uh, substrate, so it's non-nephrotoxic. But you know those limiting GI toxicity led to failure in the phase three trial, right? This is data from the phase two trial that that we led that showed that 100 milligrams twice weekly was improved uh, CMB viremia uh, significantly compared with placebo. 
But in the phase three trial uh, was a negative trial. Uh, the primary endpoint was at 24 weeks. There was less CMB, but there was more death without CMB on the treatment arm. There was a toxicity that was mostly GI toxicity that was conf confused or confounded by as DVHD, right? And what I wanted to show is that this is the antiviral activity against CMV, right? So there was an antiviral activity, but then because of GVHD, there was no uh, you know, significant difference at 24 weeks, okay? Um, because of the toxicity and because of the negative finding, uh, you know, the drug was not pursued, the oral formulation, what I wanted to show is that because everybody knew that Cydophobia and Cydophobia were, you know, broad spectrum antivirals, there was a pre-specified secondary endpoint on BK disease, right? So all these patients had prospectively collected samples and all these patients every week during treatment and on every follow-up, they were asked about GU symptoms. And if they had GU symptoms, they were tested again for BK virus. And what you can see here with a drug that's 100 to 400% more potent than Cydophobia, in a placebo controlled trial, double blind, there was no impact of Brincidophobia on the incidence of BK. If anything, because of the GBHD full, uh, fooling of, of doctors, the incidence of Brincidophobia associated, and the incidence of BK clinical disease was actually higher in the pregnancy of your arm, even though it was not statistically significant, right? So after I saw this data, you know, in the past, I used to use cytophobia for patients with severe BK, um, but we were never sure if it worked or not. But after this, we stopped doing this at the Dana-Farber and the Brigham because having a drug that's more potent than cytophobia has a higher intercellular concentrations there was no signal as a prophylactic of preventing uh, BK disease. So um, one of my takes is that I no longer use cydophobia for BK disease. So what else is uh, cydophobia uh, used in uh, bone marrow transplant patients? Well, one is topically for uh, cutaneous herpes simplex that's resistant to acyclovir. This is the first report from 1994, um, you know, from the clerks group showing that they gave topical cytophobia leading to resolution in somebody who was a cyclovir and foscarnet resistance, right? Uh, one thing that's important about when you use cytophobia systemically is for, let's say for adenovirus or CMV is that you could see herpes simplex reactivation in this context they're not necessarily resistant. So what we now do is if we're using cytophobia, especially for herpes simplex, and especially the first few weeks before you go to steady state, we continue a cyclovir prophylaxis in these patients. And our, um, you know, we had published this in transplant ID, but I had forgotten about it, but there is this report about using acidophobia oral rinse solution, not a cream for topical application, but an oral rinse. And this group at MD Anderson used it twice a day, you know, like a switch and spit. And it was very effective in controlling uh, oral healthy simplex. And one thing that they point in the paper is that the labial ulcer that was not exposed to, uh, to the suspension because it was meant for oral administration, got worse, whereas uh, everything else looked better. Um, it, you know, as we said, it's active against uh, papilloma viruses, and topical cytophobia has been used uh, for treatment of recalcitrant warts when other treatments are not successful in transplant patients. This is one example. This is another example that's more extensive. I thought it was interesting, right? That you could say this is a chronic DVHD or a chronic situation, but really was on biopsy, uh, Baruca or warts. Okay. Uh, and then um, there's this interesting cutaneous disease called trichodysplasia spinulosa, which is now confirmed to be caused by a, a polyomavirus, right? 
and that is also responds to topical cytophilia. Uh, here are two cases, and there are several cases reported in the literature. Uh, when you see this type of rash, just think about trichodyspasia spinulosa and using topical cytophilia for these patients. And then now the case report level is um, patients with ORF. Um, you know, in immunocompetent patients, it's a self-limited disease, but this is a case of ORF that um, the lesions were, I didn't show you the whole sequence here, but the, the lesion kept growing uh, after six weeks of diagnosis, right? So usually it should have resolved by a month. So given this, they decided to use topical cytophilia and that led to resolution. So how do I use Cytophilia in 2020? I think it's my go-to drug for the noviral diseases. Um, we have no access to bring Cytophilia anymore. Um, uh, so I don't know, for the noviral disease, um, we use it preemptively in patients at high risk uh, with rising at the noviral level. So who are these patients at Dana Farber these days? Core blood patients, patients who get T-cell depletion. Um, those will be the top groups. We don't routinely screen people with, uh, with haploidentical transplants, um, but we will do syndromatic screening rate. Somebody comes with fevers, somebody comes with hepatitis, somebody comes with diarrhea, somebody comes with pneumonia or respiratory illness, we always look for adenovirus, okay? And then um, we use the adenovirus blood load to stra risk stratify patients. And if they have significant disease and the virus load is more than 10,000, or 100 times, depending on that risk, uh, we will treat them with cytophobia. I'm sorry. Uh, and then um, in that situation, we will continue weekly until the disease has resolved um, and the, the virus load has negativized. Sometimes when we go to maintenance every other week, we see the infection recrudesce. So this is a, a way we use cytophobia uh, every week, even beyond week two. Okay, sometimes if we have renal dysfunction or if um, it goes away and then there is relapse, sometimes we'll do it like every 10 days, you know, like a Monday and a Thursday on alternative weeks, uh, alternate weeks. So uh, again, those are tricks that we use here in Boston. For cytomegalovirus, uh, before we had access to letermovir and the trials with Marivir, we used to use it as a step-down therapy uh, for toxicity to other agents, especially people with uh, a lot of myelo, uh, myelosuppression, uh, we would use it as a step-down therapy, but we would wait. And at the beginning, we used to give it liberally, but we will see a lot of failures. So basically, nowadays, we wait until the virus load is below 1,000 before we consider it, and even better if it's below 500. And we will use it as secondary prophylaxis in patients at high risk of recurrences and disease if other options for prophylaxis are not available. Right, so sometimes we will do very high doses of cyclovir. Some day, sometimes we would do um, uh, for, um, cytophobia for secondary prophylaxis. And again, in here we expect a 25 to 30 percent failure rate, uh, even with this condition. So we continue monitoring. Um, I think uh, for HSV is a good systemic therapy if the isolate is resistant and you have multifocal disease or systemic disease. Uh, this is rare, but, but we use it frequently for topical therapy for localized disease, you know, in, in the lips or perianal area. And as I said, we no longer use it for BK associated diseases. So as, I guess the take home point, point is that I don't always treat viral infections with cytophobia, but when I do, I always use five milligrams per kilogram. There are a lot of papers using one or three, I think from the randomized trials, and uh, from just understanding of the drug, when you use a lower concentration of the drug, you're not getting it into the cells. You don't have, you're not generating that concentration gradient. So you're just treating yourself and wasting the drug. So uh, even in renal failure, we've had patients even with kidney transplants with allograft nephritis with adenovirus, we use five millions per kilogram up front and patients recover. So um, just as an important point here. And I just want to thank you for the invitation and for being with you uh, there in India from here, being here in Boston at the same time.